we get into any discussion about the promising Souls likes of 2023, let me ask you a question real quick. What is a Souls like? It feels like we should probably know the answer to that by now, but for some reason there's still a lot of confusion around the term. It's like anytime there's a third person action RPG, people just say Souls like as a reflex. It's like the flex tape meme, character holding a sword, Souls like, just slap it on there. If you look online, a game like Project Eve will be granted this title, but then you watch the gameplay trailer and it feels much more reminiscent of Platinum Games work, near Automata especially, which I wouldn't for one second consider to be part of the genre. But then if that game is a Souls like, then wouldn't that mean something like Final Fantasy 16 is as well because they look really similar in how they play, but no idiot, that's not the Final Fantasy Souls like, that's the Final Fantasy Souls like. Remember that thing? You wanted to forget, but I won't let you. Alright, okay, uh, let's say that the loss of currency or souls on death is one of the defining characteristics. That seems reasonable, but then why do people call God of War inspired by Dark Souls? Just because it has slower, less hacky combat than the original trilogy? That seems a bit flimsy, but wait, Hollow Knight is a 2D Souls like Metroidvania, now I can follow that, but Crowsworn isn't a 2D Souls like Metroidvania, it's a hollow like now because of course it is. And then okay, what about Little the Devil Inside? Like, what are we expecting that to be? We also go back in time and make yeah, them DMC and Zelda Souls likes because they also have third person combat, combat, combat and apparently that's all you need. From the Ashes feels like a legitimate part of this genre, but it's a first person shooter, so I'm glad that clears things up. Importantly, how does this affect the legacy of Sonic and the Black Knight? Eventually, after a lot of thinking, I came to the conclusion that video game genres are stupid, their definitions make no sense, and I've wasted over a minute of your time talking about nothing. Thing, so let's go with gut feeling here. Let's talk about the future of Souls Likes in 2023 because that's set up to be a big year for the genre. 2022 was no slouch in that area either, to be fair. We got that little project out of a Japanese studio that sort of came and went. Not many people talked about it, but it's okay. You'll get them next time, guys. And then we have games like Thymesia and Steel Rising. And what these games have taught me is that people are relentless when it comes to reviewing anything in this family of games that isn't made by From Software. Thymesia, 70% on Metacritic, 6 out of 10 on IGN, which is basically a 3 out of 10. Steel Rising, also a 70, also a 6 out of 10 on IGN. These are good games. These are fun games. I reviewed Steel Rising a bit over a week back. It's got problems, but it's very competently built, feels different, and has some amazingly jaw-dropping boss designs and creative animations. It deserves more than this kind of reception, in my opinion. I'm not interested in whether we get good Souls likes in 2023. I'm looking at this list that I got here, and it's pretty clear that we're gonna get at least a few good ones. But I am curious to see if these smaller studios can finally achieve the quantifiable critical success from these people actually attaching numbers to their stuff, or if they'll continue to be cast aside for not being as comprehensive as From Software's work. I think the game from next year that has the best chance of achieving critical success from a smaller studio is Lies of P. Still a trash name, I won't budge on that opinion, but everything else about this I've been on board with since it was announced. Yes, okay, it very clearly looks a lot like Bloodborne to a just edging on uncomfortable degree, but hot take, I don't care. Do you know how difficult it is to make a video game? If you want to try and copy one of the greatest games I've ever played and give me different levels and enemies and bosses, then who am I to stop you? Why would I want to stop you? If we may never get Bloodborne 2, then give me Pinocchio Bloodborne any day of the week. One thing about Lies of P that gives me a lot of confidence is the level of confidence that the dev team has. They've shown this thing off in large uncut stretches, let its audience scrutinize every inch of what they're doing, given a lot of access to press and letting them cover it however they want. In fact, I'd argue that they've maybe been a bit too open with this game because the thing is, you know, it's not out yet, which means that some things aren't finalized or finished. So what ends up what I'm trying to say here is basically what it- you know what, just roll the clip. You cunning rascal. You won't get through here, die. <laughs> uh, did, did you see how mad that donkey was? Listen, have I heard worse voice acting? No, I don't think so. That was pretty rough. They actually had to come in later and comment on the video saying that the voice work was a temporary placeholder because people were clowning that section so hard, and yeah, duh, that's obviously not gonna be the final voice work we've seen how the more polished voice acting sounds, but they did maybe go a touch overboard with what they showed. Still, this game is not hiding in the shadows. It's not some clunky experience that they quickly edited to look way better than it is. It isn't a buggy, laggy mess. In fact, everyone who played the game mentioned how they never ran into any frame drops or bugs despite how much were shared and how good this game looks. It's it's kind of incredible how legit this thing seems despite being a massive undertaking from a smaller studio. It looks like it has some solid weapon variety, a play on Sekiro's prosthetic tools is incorporated as well, you can get drippy, and like I mentioned in my dedicated video on the game which came up before we'd seen too much gameplay, a big potential X factor is the story. Tackling the tale of Pinocchio and combining it with a dark Victorian setting and a reactive world with multiple endings based on the theme of how truthful your main character is sounds brilliant, and while a lot of Souls likes try to emulate that cryptic, vague nature of FromSoft storytelling, usually to a lesser effect, 
project, I'm hoping Lies of P just commits to telling a real story with this structure. If it does that, and it changes the voice acting of the donkey so it doesn't sound like video game donkey making fun of voice acting, it'll be an incredible shape, and of every game on this list, it's what I have the most faith in. This game looks unbelievable without actually seeming undoable, we've seen major parts of it in action, running great, apparently playing and feeling great, and a game with this much promise and nothing to hide is so refreshing and enticing in a landscape where it feels like more and more games are trying to trick you into buying them. Now what we're gonna do is hardcore parkour our way to a game that feels so much more fragile than Lies of P that a slight gust of wind could knock it into instant classic or total dud territory, Black Myth Wukong. This is a Chinese developed game, we don't get many of those, and the intention of it was to bring legitimacy to the Chinese development scene and represent some of their folklore in a mainstream title. Its first trailer exploded on release, people have been keeping an eye on it for a very long time, and for good reason, it does look pretty insane. It's built off Unreal Engine 5 and looks ridiculous, particularly the enemy and boss designs, look at this, look at this, look at this, and that's not even mentioning the way that some of these attacks look, the writhing roots from this ground pound, your own little perch and slam, it's so above and beyond what you'd expect from a game that burst into the scene so suddenly. It's based off the Chinese story Journey to the West, and I'm glad that we're getting different folklore in some of these games, it can't all be Greek and Roman and Norse, we gotta shake it up every once in a while. You're able to launch into a bunch of different forums, a cicada, a fire demon, a bunch of clones of yourself, a big dookie, apparently Sun Wukong, the Monkey King, is supposed to have 72 transformations, but I don't believe the actual number available in the game has been officially confirmed. Overall, there's just a sense of grandeur and ambition here. Now for the bad stuff. Uh, first of all, as good as the game looks, there have definitely been some problems in the demos we've been shown. For example, the run cycle looks very unwieldy. A lack of enemy stagger for most of your attacks really reduces the impact of them and makes everything feel a bit spongy, and some smaller things like the fog effects look a bit overused or improperly implemented. It's nothing that can't be fixed, it's nothing game-breaking, it's just polish at the end of the day. What's more concerning are the reports of the behind-the-scenes issues with the game. YouTuber Ranton was able to get some info that seems pretty legit considering it included the date of the next Black Myth Wukong gameplay showcase to the date months in advance, and in it were mentions of senior team members leaving the game, internal drama, lots of openings for higher-up positions, and the revelation that only one area was actually finished by August 2021, and the rest of the game didn't even have enemies, cutscenes, or bosses at the time. Now, Ranton mentions that that statement's a bit weird because we have seen a bunch of bosses and areas in the trailers, and I would agree that I think that they're probably being worked on in isolated environments and haven't been fully integrated into the levels yet, or they just haven't been completed or something, but all that said, if these rumors are true, then at the very least, this game probably won't make its 2023 placeholder date, and at the worst, it's in serious jeopardy, standing as a bit of a tech demo right now. There was also a lot of controversy around the founder of the dev team Game Science, who had some pretty weird and questionable comments surrounding women, as the very best of gamers do. Can you even play a game without hating women? I don't think so. But since this doesn't directly have anything to do with the game's quality, I'm gonna leave it at that for this video, but I do encourage you to check this out if you want to know more about that situation. Essentially, as much promise as Black Myth Wukong has shown, and in fairness how much raw footage we've seen, there seems to be a lot more going on behind the scenes that threatens to severely impact its overall quality. This is a game that we can't be sure of either way. Will it hit next year? Will it be delayed for a considerable amount of time? Will it find a way to meet its sky-high expectations? Will it barely function how it's supposed to, who knows, but either way, it's a story worth following for sure. What's interesting to me is that I've heard a lot of talk and excitement about these games from relatively unknown studios, which is really cool, but I haven't heard much about this one game that's coming from not only a well-established team, but also the team behind the only series that gets mentioned in the same breath as the direct Soulsborne series, no less. Wolong Fallen Dynasty by Team Ninja is set for early 2023, these are the guys behind Ninja Gaiden, behind Neo, behind Dead or Alive, behind... They made Ninja Gaiden. Look, okay, yeah, Stranger of Paradise was weird, but the studio still knows how to make games, and this one, similar to Black Myth Wukong, is also focused on Chinese mythology. Look at that, two at once, out of nowhere. One thing that always pushed me away from the Neo games, other than the fact that some of the attacks are just ridiculously unfair to the player, is the reliance on loot, and thankfully Team Ninja has confirmed that Wolong won't be nearly as loot heavy, so you already got me on board there. Combat also seems a lot flashier here without the need for an obscene amount of effects with vaults and slams and really fluid spins when you parry. It all seems like an attempt to merge that patented, strategic, dangerous, and rewarding combat of souls with the flair of your typical hack and slasher. And the added jump functionality reportedly leads to a lot more verticality in levels, which are still linear just like their spiritual predecessor. If I'm counting right, and I'm probably not because I've been out of school for 16 months and I'm slowly losing all of my brain cells, this video should come out right around the time that Tokyo Game Show is happening, which is meant to show a lot of gameplay snippets of Wolong Fallen Dynasty. While I'm working with pretty limited info for now, having not seen that footage that you maybe have before watching this video, I am 
excited to see more of this since as great as the intertwined massive worlds and grounded combat of Souls games can be, I've gone on record saying that I want devs to take different approaches and a vertical, flashy, linear experience without the incessant looting of Neo sounds right up my alley. Just butting in here from the future with uh, slightly worse lighting conditions, although at least there's no glare ruining the whole shot this time around. Thanks, lamp that I turned on last minute. Just wanted to say that TGS did give us a bunch of gameplay and information, but more importantly, it gave us a limited playable demo that anyone can try out. It's not just press, so go check that out. Uh, it's really cool. It runs until, I believe, the 26th of September, so if you're in the first, like, 10-ish days of this video going out, um, you should be able to play it. If not, go check out videos on it. Um, it's, it's really fun. Uh, I won't get into it all right now, but yeah, it's, it's there if you want to play it. I would call these three Souls likes the big three of 2023. Each one of these, if they capitalize on their promise, can be in contention for the best games of the year. They just have so much going for them, even with a few things maybe holding them back. And even if we get like two out of three of these to hit and toss in some potential Elden Ring DLC, that is going to be a huge year for this format of games. But what about the more supplemental stuff? There's still some games that maybe don't have the same weight as the three I just mentioned, but just like Steel Rising and Thymesia, they can find a more niche audience and introduce ideas that really expand the framework even further. The first one of these for me is Flintlock. This seems to have a lot of shared identity, specifically in its art style, location design, and movement with Forspoken. It immediately gives off a similar vibe. It seems a bit rough around the edges, maybe isn't the smoothest looking game at the moment, but hopefully that gets worked out. This one allows you to use a gun alongside your axe. There seems to be a shift in focus away from enemy variety and towards cinematic angles and flashy finishers. It's apparently gunning to mesh the Souls-like combat and systems of Elden Ring and the visual flourishes and story focus of God of War. Some big names to throw around, and if I'm being honest, might sound a bit too ambitious for what this game looks like, but I respect them for shooting for the best. The little fox companion flying around hitting things is kind of annoying. I don't know if you can control it or if it's automatic, but it really clutters the screen. And it seems like a weird choice to have a brutal combat system while being this against gore. You can even stick your axe fully into someone and it just kind of awkwardly phases through them. Maybe they're trying to crack a T for teen rating, but I hope they just implement that stuff for the final release. I'm not sure if it'll turn heads when it comes out. I expect it to be a solid game that doesn't really hit a wider audience, but I do like a lot of its ideas and I'm interested to see what story it winds up telling. Project Relic is another slightly choppy looking one and it definitely overdoes its dark and grainy visual gimmick, but it's also shown off some really fluid combat complete with sliding and parrying. I don't know why the camera is so close to the character, it really blocks up the screen and would probably suck when you're fighting people and trying to see what attacks they're doing, but one thing I really enjoyed in its more recent trailer were the enemies. They're kind of not scary, but dark and imposing without being too big and fantastical. The feeling of this trailer made up for the lack of polish, especially when this hooded gore looking dude is on screen, and it's kind of crazy because gore's in this trailer more than he is in the entirety of Love and Thunder. Ho ho ho! wasted potential of a movie. Again, probably won't take the world over, but I thought it looked kind of cool. And then we have The Return of the King. The original Dark Souls copy is back. Lords of the Fallen was basically a meme for how bad it was. It was the prime example of why no one could do what FromSoft could, and a lot of people nowadays want to pretend like, no, it actually was good. People were just mad because it was similar to Dark Souls, but that's a whole genre now, so it's fine. No, don't let them fool you. This was clunky. The fighting looks like it was playing at 0.5 speed. There was this weird glossy, fake look to it that didn't seem 100% intentional. The AI the levels, it was all a mess. So what do you do when the first one is so bad that you want people to just completely forget it? Apparently you add the at the beginning of the name and pretend like it's the first time you're actually trying this idea out. I call it the Suicide Squad method. The Lords of the Fallen only has a cinematic trailer as of now, so I can't act like I know it'll have a massive shift in quality, but Deck 13 in the meantime has made the Surge series, which in my opinion is actually really solid and came into its own. So another crack at the medieval setting might actually work out well for them. This will probably be the most classic back to basics entry on this list, which might be a nice thing to have after all the experimentation. Uh, who knows, Deck 13's been doing this a lot longer than anyone. Or, well, mostly anyone. They're also developing another game that's set for next year named Atlas Fallen, and can I just say, whoever came up with the momentum system that's described for this game should get a raise, and whoever comes up with the names at Deck 13 should be fired. This isn't actually a Souls-like, and I know this because, um, they said it, but I thought I'd mention it because it's from the same devs and it is a third-person action game, so at least it has the same interest range. The momentum system I mentioned earlier is that keeping a combo up in this game means you unlock more attacks as you go, which pushes you to be more offensive, but this makes you more susceptible to damage. I think that sounds pretty cool. And you can surf on the sand. I mean, come on, that's amazing. Another similar game is Where Winds Meet. Again, not a Souls-like, but people thought it might be at first. It's got a wickedly aggressive combat system, a bunch of powers, unique moves, and about eight frames per second, so fingers crossed they get that fixed. What are some of the Souls that I missed from 2023. Obviously, you have the 2D stuff like Pro Sworn, and like I mentioned, the definition is so loose at this point that you could be asking, where's Jedi Survivor? And I could be like, that's way more like Sekiro than 
and Souls and you'd ask what's the difference and I'd say I don't know I also named two games at the end that I admitted weren't Souls likes at all so I'm not even sure what I'm doing at this point and then we meet in the middle and just agree that you can toss your game in the comments and we can all be happy if you enjoyed the video give it a like uh, check out my discord it's in the description uh, if you're new here subscribe and I will see you all next time peace